Hello, we're so happy to have you for another episode of Encounter with God Together. And I have back with me Perry Wooten, who was on the uh, the show several weeks ago. Perry is on the Northeast Regional Council for Scripture Union, uh, overseeing ministry in the Northeast of, of the country. And um, he is a retired pastor, but still quite active in taking preaching and speaking opportunities. And Perry, uh, so happy to have you back with us today and look forward to uh, what, what God's going to give to you to say. Well, thank How you, are you today? Pleasure to be here, pleasure to be here. Good, I know you've had a busy day already with some uh, some ministry uh, responsibilities and some this evening. So happy that you're here in the afternoon to, to uh, kick us off this week. Well, I am too, I'm very thankful for the opportunity. And we are continuing in Joshua, where we were last week, and um, we're in Joshua 7, 8, and parts of 10. And uh, I, I suggested to Perry that he not try to cover the whole of that, but to uh, give us what, what God was speaking to him that we could uh, look out for this week. So Perry, I'm going to turn it over to you. What is, what's been on your mind? All right. Well, shall we open with prayer? Absolutely. Okay. Our Father and our God, we pray that you will open our hearts to what you would have us know. And we pray, Father, that you will guide us and lead us in what we say, what we think, and ultimately what we do as servants of the living God. In Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, as you say, Dale, it's an opportunity to speak about this wonderful book of Joshua. And we'll be discussing uh, chapter 7, 8, and 10. Um, of course, the book of Joshua... Uh, portrays God as sovereign in world events and active in behalf of people Israel and faithful to the promises of his covenant. Mm. And Joshua affirms the theology that God brought victory and gave Israel the land promised to Abraham and describes the conquest of the land of Canaan under the leadership of Joshua, who is, of course, Moses' uh, successor. The theme of the book is victory through faith. And Joshua's name means the Lord saves, or mm. the Lord is salvation. And uh, the Greek rendering of his name, of course, is Joshua or Jesus. So as we know, Joshua, Jesus, the same meaning. So this is makes it doubly important. Yes. It, uh, at the beginning of their push into the promised land, of course, the people of Israel were poised at the border. Uh, the early narratives show little interest in political, military, or personal issues. Uh, they focused instead on God's role in overthrowing the cities of Canaan. But it is clear that the destruction of the indigenous people uh, was not simply to make room for the Israelites, because the Canaanites and the other inhabitants of the land uh, are portrayed as having brought the judgment of God on themselves by their worship of idols and uh, false gods. Well, parenthetically, we should note in the story of Rahab in Joshua 2, which I'm sure you went over, uh, it's significant in this regard, in that it shows that those under the judgment of God who respond in faith will be spared. So this is a very important book, and mm. uh, learning about the history of Israel. So we'll briefly discuss, as we said, uh, chapter 7, 8, and 10. Mm -hmm. and going to chapter 7, uh, the context and background of the book of Joshua is underscored in this particular chapter. Uh, the Israelites demonstrated many sins as they sought and fought to enter the promised land. For example, they demonstrated the sin of excessive self-confidence, mm. thinking that they could conquer the army of, of I, um, without God's guidance and approval by sending a skeleton force of 3,000 men instead of their whole fighting force in order to fight the people, the soldiers of I. Therefore, God did not give them the victory they sought. The problem was not that they failed to examine and scout out the army or the enemy. Uh, rather, they failed to ask God about sending a small force to battle their powerful enemy. Israel lost, not because of their reduced army, but because of the sin of Achan, which God held against them. Predictably, with that defeat, 
the people challenged Joshua and indeed challenged God regarding the purpose of their departure from Egypt. And we read this in chapter uh, 7, verses 4 to 9. Uh, it reads, So about 3,000 men went up, but they were routed by the men of Ai, who killed about 36 of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries and struck them down on the slopes. At this, the hearts of the people melted and became like water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there till evening. The elders of Israel did the same and sprinkled dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Ah, sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring this people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Ammonites, Amorites to destroy us. If only we had been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan. <laughs> oh Lord, what can I say now that Israel has been routed by its enemies? The Canaanites and the other people of the country will hear about this and they will surround us and wipe out our name from the earth. What then will you do for your own great name? How many times have we all thought that, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, why did you do this to me? It's all your fault. What am I doing here? They are going to take advantage of me. Well, of course, as we read in Joshua 7, as we uh, read in our own lives, if we're honest, uh, it wasn't God who was against us. It was what we did to turn God in a way other than what he wanted. Well, the story of Achan, of course, is uh, the dominant theme in uh, chapter 7. Um, he prompted God to withdraw his support of Israel in the Battle of Ai, um, and it's noteworthy. He was a member of the tribe of Judah, and again, look at the tradition of Judah, and look who's in that tribe of Judah. Here's a man who, uh, who took sacred items for himself and therefore brought a tragedy and defeat on mm -hmm. the army of Israel as they sought to conquer the city of Ai. And again, looking at chapter 7 in the first verse, we see this wonderful um, passage, but the Israelites acted unfaithfully in regard to the devoted things. Achan, son of Carmi, son of Zimri, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took some of them. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. And then in verses 10 to 12, we read, the Lord said to Joshua, stand up. This was after he had been lying, he and the elders had been lying on the ground for so long. Stand up. What are you doing down on your face? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen. They have lied. They have put them with their own possessions. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and run because they have been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. And then in verses 20 and 21, Achan, of course, who's the culprit who caused the defeat by his stealing or taking a, um, those items that were sacred, uh, he replied, it is true, I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. Thank God for confession, huh? Yeah. This, this, this is what I have done. When I saw in the plunder of a beautiful robe from Babylon, Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. He, hid, he knew that he had done wrong, but he hid the treasures in his own tent. Again, this is not a biography, or may I say an autobiography, but it is such a, such a uh, recurring theme in all of our lives. And we'll get to that a little bit more. Yeah. But, uh, as we explore chapter 7, we see the power of sin <clears throat> as personified in, in Achan, who, as we read, 
or as we read, took items devoted to God for himself instead of putting them in God's treasury. We see in this incident that sin robs God. Let me say that again. Sin robs God. When Achan decided that for whatever reason he deserved, he deserved these valuable items more than Israel, more than God, because they were to go in his place, and that they did not need to be put in God's treasury. He only brought, of course, uh, tragedy and sin on himself and brought problems and difficulties and defeat on his country. The entire nation paid a price for this one person's pride and his selfishness. Mm. So this, this incident reminds us that sin not only implies a delight in what God abominates, sin implies a delight in what God abominates. Uh, and that's the truth, isn't it? When we sin, what we're saying is, God, I delight in what I'm doing more than what I delight in what you want. Um, that's exactly what Aiken did. It's, as I said, it's a story, it's a biography and an autobiography. Uh, <laughs> it, it also is a violation of our covenant to honor him and to do his will. Two, insofar as Aiken hid what he had stolen, we again are reminded that secrecy usually accompanies the life and acts of our sin. Mm. We don't blurt them out, we hide them, unless we're so prideful and say, look at me. Well, this whole episode emphasizes how the ruin of many, family, uh, church, uh, community, can come as a result of one person's prideful actions and decisions. To Achan, taking those sacred items and putting them in his own tent was, was no big thing, as we say. Well, but to God, uh, all sin is unacceptable and will be punished. Importantly, Achan's sin was initially discovered not by his confession. Mm. But as we read further in the chapter, it was discovered by Joshua's prayer. Again, prayer exposes sin prayer reveals what God wants us to do and hopefully gives us the strength to do it. Mm. Now, going on to chapter 8 very quickly, um, it describes a Israel's victory over I, one of the other uh, may we, we would call them nations in the area. It also emphasizes that we must not indulge in despondency. Rather, we should examine ourselves as Joshua and the Israelites examine themselves to determine the source of their defeat and then turn and follow God's will. They acted and ultimately defeated Ai and renewed their covenant with God in Mount Ebal, where Joshua built an altar to the Lord as Moses had commanded the Israelites to do several years before. Now, turning lastly to chapter 10, uh, chapter 10 underscores the result of prayer and obedience to God. One of the most important inspiring stories is in all of scripture is the one in this chapter, which tells how Joshua prayed and the sun stood still in the sky to give the Israelites time to defeat their enemies, the Amorites. In Joshua 10 verses 9 to 14 which again is a very uh, interesting passage um, and tells us of this situation. In verse nine, after an all night march from Gilgal, Joshua took them by surprise. The Lord threw them into confusion before Israel who defeated them in a great victory at Gibeon. Israel pursued them along the road going up to Beth Haran and cut them down all the way to Azekah and Makala. As they fled before Israel on the road down to Beth Haran to Azekah, the Lord hurled large hailstones down on them from the sky, and more of them died from the hailstones than were killed by the swords of the Israelites. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, 
Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, O sun, stand still over Gibeon. O moon, over the valley of Ajlan. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the nation avenged itself on its enemies, as it is written in the book of Jashar. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. There was, has never been a day like it before or since, a day when the Lord listened to a man. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. And then lastly in verse 42, um, it takes this up. All the kings and all in their lands Joshua conquered in one campaign because the Lord, the God of Israel, fought for Israel. Now that's the key thing that when, um, of course, uh, Achan stole the items and uh, through prayer he confessed and, and uh, God withheld his, his help, his mercy, his guidance, his strength until the confession came. And when the confession came, he came back and even, in, even to the point of, of halting the sun and the moon in the sky. So uh, uh, these victories, though, as we read about in all these chapters and the victories of uh, Joshua and the Israelites did not come by hand, God's hands alone. And this is what we must always recognize. The Israelites had to fight their enemy, but they did it in accordance with God's will. They went on to defeat other armies, other arm, armies and cities and so-called nations as well. This again confirms that the answer to prayer is more effective than work by itself. Had Joshua and the army of Israel not done their best, the hailstones would not have fallen on the enemy. But inasmuch as Joshua was doing his work, God helped him. And more execution was done by God from heaven than by Joshua's troops on earth. So this in conclusion tells us that he who works but does not pray will be rewarded with less success than he who works with prayer. Hmm. So in conclusion, uh, if we're not as successful as we would wish, uh, we should ask in prayer whether we are doing God's will uh, as we ask him to work with us. Heavenly light will never fail him who is fighting in God's cause. Therefore, we shall speak of his testimonies even before kings and shall not be ashamed. Amen. Mm. Amen. Thank you so much, Perry. Uh, that is a remarkable story. Definitely what I would call an unfair advantage. <laughs> <laughs> I would think most people would call it. And certainly the enemies of Israel said that's unfair. How did yeah. Israel stop the sun in the sky? Of course, yeah. them, the sun moved. Obviously, we know different now. But uh, God stopped everything in order to give Israel the time to, to be victorious. And this came through prayer and devotion to him. I think that's, the, that's one of the key messages. That is great. Well, let me pray right now. <clears throat> Father, I thank you for Perry. I thank you for um, your word. I thank you for your remarkable uh, work throughout history uh, among and for your people and for your glory. And Father, we do pray that you will be done on earth as it is in heaven and that we would be able to participate in that work, that you would help us to be faithful and prayerful, steadfast and unmovable. And God, that you uh, will continue uh, to accomplish your purposes in our world. And uh, we pray this week for our readers and our listeners and ask that you be working with them in their lives and that we all might become uh, better at seeking you and your will. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, thank you, Perry. I think you've given us a good overview and a lot to meditate on as we go through the week's reflections. Well, thank God for the opportunity. I enjoy being with you as always. Yes, and it's great to have you. And I know you've got more miles to go today. So well, blessings you, on that. Gail bless, and Gail, bless your ministry. You're doing thank a you. job. wonderful job. Thank, thank you so much. And uh, if uh, actually, if you are not currently reading our, um, 
our encounter with God, you can get that at our website, which is on the, the scroll on the screen there. And um, you'll be able to read it online, subscribe to email or, or also uh, order the print version of the book. So we hope if you have just discovered us that you'll join us uh, each day in, in encountering God and his word. And uh, Perry, I wish you well, and we'll see you again soon, I'm sure. You too. God bless you. God bless okay. all, all people. Thank you. So all right. Bye for now. See you soon. Bye-bye.